When, you're, when we're under the fight or flight nervous system, we have to get a super rush of energy and the brain has to become super alert. We have to become super vigilant because there's an emergency. We're now in high gear. Now, you have three levels of beta. You have low level beta. Right now, you and I pretty much are in low level beta. If I said to you, listen, I'm going to test you on all this material and if you don't pass the test, you can't leave tonight. You may move into a little mid-range beta. Well, high range beta is like twice as high as mid range beta, and that's when you're freaked out, when you're scared, when you're angry, when you're frustrated. And in high range beta, it's like driving your sports car in first gear. And the brain begins to break down, and the patterns that you see on EEG readings become very incoherent. Yeah. So in high beta, you believe that the outer world is more real than the inner world. And in high beta, your brain is running a loop and you're overly analyzing your problems and the analysis is causing the emotions to be reinforced. And when you begin to realize that in order for you to change, your brain has to move from beta to alpha. And in alpha, the inner world starts to become more real than the outer world. If you're addicted to those emotions, no new information no. can come into the nervous like system wall. that is not equal to the emotion. Yeah. And that's why when people get in this state, they get lost because they can't hear it because it's not a time to learn. It's not a time for new information. It's time to react and survive. So when the emotions get highly addictive and the brain moves in this pattern, people are trying to force the outcome and use the ego to change their life. Now, Moving into meditative states is moving into those alpha states where the, you begin to eliminate the information from the external environment. When you begin to slip back into alpha, your thinking brain quiets way down. Mm -hmm. Now, people do this all the time. They don't know they do it. When you're driving down the road in, the, in your car and all of a sudden you're driving and all of a sudden you... Somewhere be, just above Delta. <laughs> you're, well, you're trancing out and you're yeah, thinking exactly. about something and you're not aware of your body. You don't see the road or the environment. You've lost track of you time. you lost track of time. Your brain moves from beta to alpha. We could say that in that moment, the inner world became more real than the outer world. The imaginary world became more real than the external world. Now, if you're in high beta, that never happens. Right. Because the brain doesn't pause enough to store information. You know, knowledge is the precursor, precursor to experience. The more knowledge you have, you're more prepared for the experience. And I think that when you go to these conferences, and this is why I kind of stopped doing a lot of the conferences and keynotes, because it's philosophy. Mm -hmm. Until you initiate that philosophy, yes. yeah, until you initiate it and practice it, does it become truth or wisdom? So if people need to write that stuff down and idiomotor-wise create some circuits in their brain and that's how they pay attention, mm -hmm. then go for it. Mm -hmm. But don't sit there and analyze the information. And take the information and ask this simple question, how can I use this in my life? Now once you start applying it, you just went from the philosopher to the initiate. And if you can reproduce an experience based on the knowledge you learn over and over again, now you're beginning to master that knowledge. Yes. You go from knowing all the way to knowingness. You know to knowing to knowingness. And when you get to that point of knowingness where you know that you know, or you know how, but you've done it so many times you don't even know how you know how, it's now innate in you. It's who you are. And that's where we need to go as a culture. We need to all of a sudden break from these philosophical arguments. I mean, that's why we're doing the workshops, because we're, we're all about really, you know, it's a time in history not just to, to learn information, it's a time in history really to learn how to use that information. Absolutely. If you took one hour of your day and retreated from your life, truly shut off your cell phone, shut, powered down the computer, you got up at five in the morning or whatever time's good for you before your day, when your brain is already in alpha and the brain chemistry is just right to dream. And you sat down and you said, what is the greatest ideal of myself that I want to present to the world today? 
and you sat there and you changed your state of being until you worked until you were that person you would have to forget about the people in your life the things that you have to do the things you own the places you have to go at different times and all the experiences in your life that reaffirm your identity now this is what a, a, a change in coherence looks like in the brain. If you look on the left side, this person has a lot of chatter going on in their brain. Their brain is working way too hard. They're thinking about everything. They're analyzing their life within the emotions that they're memorized. Their brain is in a high arousal state. After one meditation, we see a normal, healthy brain. So you got two parts of the brain, two halves of the brain communicating. That is a level of wholeness where the person is literally viewing their life from a different mind. Now, Constantine's work allows us to measure the field around the body, but then the, uh, the different energy centers. I don't like to call them chakras, but I right. call them energy centers because they're literally hormone centers that carry nerve plexuses or minds with them. They're levels of consciousness. So you can measure the person's level of chakra balance based on their size of expression, healthiness, robustness. And then the way we measure whether they're working properly is whether they're aligned or we move them off. So the weaker or more imbalanced they are, the more we move them off, the more they move off. So we do a meditation at the beginning of every day to bless every one of these centers with new information. At the end of one meditation, you have to get into your autonomic nervous system. I'll you have to get that, beyond yeah. your analytical mind. You have to enter into the subconscious system to make the change. Here's a person whose energy is way off after one meditation their energy is more aligned and you can see some of those energy centers actually enlarged. Right. Take a look at this person, they're doing pretty good, mm -hmm. but after the meditation, they're doing really well. Look at the size of those energy centers compared pre and post. You can see look at that. they're just more, yeah. more robust, they're more filled, they're more, they're more heightened, mm -hmm. and this person's going to have a good day. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so that was a great way for us to measure, like in other words, you can't change these systems with your conscious mind. As, you, as consciousness falls out of the neocortex, you move deeper into the autonomic nervous system, you know that fight or flight parasympathetic nervous system, that autonomic automatic nervous system that causes you to salivate when you see the chocolate cake. Well, if you're changing the program now, you're changing it in the autonomic nervous system, you won't salivate any longer because you changed it there. This is bliss in the brain. You can see right around the third level, the third row down there, second one over uh, from the left, you see a brain that's bright red. Mm -hmm. That is energy making its way to the brain. This is being in the moment. You can see a person very hypocoherent in the first slide, and mm -hmm. then in the second slide, the brain is way more organized and more balanced. Now, this woman had an amazing, amazing experience. We were watching her brain patterns during this event and she was pretty much started her event in a certain level. Her meditation went, uh, we were watching it during the event and uh, during the meditation. And I want you to see what full out ecstasy looks like in the brain. See how red that is? Yeah. That is energy. That's wow. Kundalini. This woman was sobbing. She was in so much joy and she wasn't doing it. It was happening to her. It was energy. All of that energy is as the body of the mind is moving mm. back to the brain. This person was in a state of absolute bliss, a state of absolute ecstasy. This is a person with a traumatic brain injury. All that blue means it's hypocoherent. He's struggling. The light bulb's at 10 watts instead of 50 yeah. watts. After four days of meditation, normal brain, normal brain. He's wheelchair bound at the end of this event. He stood up. <clears throat> traumatic brain injury, same guy. Look at how blue it is in all those uh, different uh, segments. In other words, he, he's not, his brain's not getting enough energy. <clears throat> this is a normal brain after four days. This is a person, when you have Parkinson's disease, the brain is working way too hard. Yes. It's hyper-coherent. The person has very, very, uh, a lot of difficulty thinking clearly. The brain is way out of balance. After uh, four days of meditation, this is a normal brain. Her tremors went away. In this particular mechanism, this particular graph, the red in this situation is measuring what's called coherence. Okay. So the redder it is in this slide means the more hyper-coherent, the more uh, static is Active, going on in yeah. the brain. So the other 
brain scan. The other, the quantitative measurement that we use is standard deviations of, of temperature. So here's the, here's the other measurement. So look how blue the brain mm -hmm. is here, which means there's not a lot of activity going on. Yes. That is a normal brain right there. Uh, this person, without any drugs, without any surgery, without anything, in her belief in herself, changed her state of being.